نحمده و نسلی على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزير من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب سدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافيا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ألهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعا اللهم أرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا آمين سم آمين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Today we will be starting our discussion of Surah An-Nisa from the verse number 15 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wallati ya'tina al-fahishata min nisa'ikum Fastashkidu alayhinna arba'atam minkum فَإِن شَاهِدُوا فَأَمْسِكُهُنَّ فِي الْبُيُوتِ حَتَّى يَتَوَفَّاهُنَّ الْمَوْتُ أَوْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُنَّ سَبِيلًا Those who commit unlawful sexual relationships of your women bring against them four witnesses from among you and if they testify confirm the guilty confine the guilty women to houses until death takes them or allah ordains for them another way the verse number 15 of surah an-nisa is basically explaining the initial punishment of adultery or zina and uh, it has been uh, ordered in this uh, verse that if uh, two women two muslim women in a muslim society they commit some immoral act an illegal sexual relationship or they commit adultery so their punishment will be given to them when four adult muslim uh, men will witness and then the punishment which is here in this verse which has been um, advised is that they should be they should be confined to their houses the reason only being that they are immoral women and uh, if they are let loose in the society they will cause the spreading of uh, immorality and promotion of uh, sins like adultery so they've been ordered to confined to their houses like that is like house arrest and this house arrest is still the death duty or the alternative is when allah ordains for them and allah ordained for them in the order of uh, surah an-nur when in the first verse of surah an-nur the punishment or the law for uh, this adultery was given that if an unmarried man or an unmarried woman commit adultery uh, the punishment of lashing and if a married man or a married woman they commit adultery then they will be uh, stoning uh, to death was the punishment which has been advised in surah nur according to the laws of surah nur so after the revelation of the verse of surah nur this verse number 15 of surah tunnisa has been annulled and it has been abrogated and uh, this annulment or abrogation of the verse is very much according to the concept of annulment or abrogation of the verses of the quran as mentioned in surah baqara allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there says ma nansuqu min ayatin aw nunsiha naqti bi khairin minha aw misliha alam ta'lam anna allah ala kulli shay'in qadir so according to that quranic aya will be annulled or they will be abrogated by the aya or the verses of quran which were revealed after that verse number 16 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says and the two two men who committed among you dishonor them both but if they repent 
and correct themselves, leave them alone. Indeed, Allah is ever accepting of, of repentance and is merciful. So now in this verse number 16 is the discussion of or the punishment of homosexuality. This is a sinful act and this evil deed was started by the people or by the nation of Hazrat Lut alayhi salam. And in a Sahih Hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said that curse is to the evil deed or the sin of the nation of Hazrat Lut alayhi salam. And similarly, in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that four people, four people on whom on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will neither look upon them, nor talk to them, or nor purify them from sins. These four people are whom? Number one being those men who behave like women and those women who behave like men and those people who have physical relationships with uh, animals and the fourth being those people who commit homosexuality. Similarly, in another hadith, Prophet Sallallahu said that there will be four people, there are four people on whom Allah curses in the heaven daily. And uh, Prophet ﷺ said that from these four, there are three for which the curse is only once and for one, the curse is thrice. And Prophet ﷺ added, cursed is the one who indulges in homosexuality. So according to Sharia, people who are indulging in any form of homosexuality, may it be gays or lesbianism, the punishment in Sharia is death. And uh, different ways in different uh, eras and different periods have been seen and uh, they were either beheaded or they were made to sit and uh, a wall was thrown on them or they were thrown from a height or uh, even certain incidents of uh, these people being burnt are reported. It is a uh, Kabira Guna. It is, uh, it is a very big sin. And it is the uh, the punishment is death. The repentance accepted by Allah is only for those who do wrong in ignorance or carelessness and then repent soon after. It is those to whom Allah will turn in forgiveness and Allah is ever knowing and wise. But repentance is not accepted of those who continue to do evil deeds up until when death comes to one of them. And then he says, indeed, I have repented now or of those who die while they are disbelievers. For them, we have prepared a painful punishment. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. In these two verses, the verse number 17 and verse number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about forgiveness, seeking forgiveness and repentance. Allah is all forgiving. And the greatest attribute of Allah is that he is all forgiving. He is Ghafoor, he is Ghafar, he, he is Ghafir Zamb, he is Qabil Taub, he is Afuvan Qadir. And the act and the deed of its bondsmen, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes the most, is seeking forgiveness and asking for repentance. In Surah Baqarah, Allah says, in Allah yuhibbu tawwabina wa yuhibbul mutatakhirin. There is absolutely no doubt that Allah loves those who, who make repentance or seek forgiveness and who keep themselves pure. That is why Prophet ﷺ has taught us a supplication after wuzu. Allahumma ja'alli min al-tawwabina wa ja'alli min al-mutatakhirin. O Allah, Make us one of those who repent and seek forgiveness and make us one of those who keep themselves pure. Seeking forgiveness and repentance is, it is a deed, it is an action of the prophets. And it is a, it is a very big blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and remember the doors of repentance are open till death prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna allaha yaqbalu at-tawbata al-'abdi ma lam yughurghur there is no doubt that allah accepts the repentance of his bondsmen till the ma- till the time of death and that is why allah has ordered his bondsmen to seek forgiveness and ask for repentance allah says in quran ya ayyuhallazina amanu tubu ila allah jamia la'allakum tuflihun o believers seek repentance so that you might be successful it is such a big offer seeking forgiveness seeking forgiveness is such a big offer and getting repentance of all the sins is such a big offer that anybody who does not avail of it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in quran wa man lam yatub fa ulaika humul humul kafi hum hum zalimun wa man lam yatub fa ulaika humul zalimun the people who do not repent who do not avail of this such a big offer they are zalim they are they are the losers that is why prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered his people to seek forgiveness very frequently prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith tubu ila allah fa inni atubu fi kulli yawmin 70 marra and in one hadith he said 70 marra and there he said 100 times so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you seek repentance for i look at me i i seek repentance in each day at least 70 times or at least 100 times so it is an action of the prophets and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that when some person a person he sins then there is a black spot on the heart but when the person seeks forgiveness the black spot disappears and the heart becomes white and clean and pure all over again but if the person sins and does not seek forgiveness or does not ask for repentance then slowly and steadily the sinful person's heart becomes black and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam related recited the verse qallab al-rahna ala qulubihim there are hearts which get rusted so a person who keeps on sinning and the person who does not seek forgiveness after sinning the whole heart becomes black this is the heart which is a rusted heart this is a heart which has stamp on it this is the heart which is a hard heart and this is a heart which is devoid of belief and faith that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the quran instructs instructs us all to seek forgiveness very frequently prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said kullu bani adam hatan khairul khatiin at-tawwabun all the bonds women all the bonds men all the sons and daughters of adam they are bound to sin but the best sinners are those who repent the best sinners are those who repent because when they repent all the sins are gone all the sins are are finished off prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said at-taibu min al-dhambi kama la dhamba lahu the person who seeks forgiveness the person who asks for repentance is like a person who never sinned who never sinned very frequently ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek forgiveness very very frequently and this month of ramadan is the month of seeking forgiveness remember some of the quranic supplications and remember some of the uh, supplications of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and keep on keep on reciting them like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in quran mentions the on the supplication of repentance of hazrat adam alayhi salam by the words he said rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min alkhasirin prophet hazrat yunus alayhi salam said la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min azwalimin and and all the prophets repented Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself has taught us so many so many supplications Quran says rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khairur rahimin and then there is a supplication of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam astaghfirullah rabbi min 
kulli zambin wa atubu ilaik Allahumma ghfir lana wa lil mu'minin wa al mu'minat wa al muslimin wa al muslimat Allahumma Allahumma innaka 'afuwan qadirun tuhibbul affa fa'fu anna fa'fu anna fa'fu anna forgive us forgive us forgive us and the best supplication which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes is a supplication seeking forgiveness اللهم اجعلني من التوابين واجعلني من المتطهرين او يو هو بيليف it is not lawful for you to inherit women inherit women by compulsion verse number 19 is mentioning about the inheritance of women what is this all about you know in the society of arab before the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam women were considered as commodities and they were not considered humans and because of that they were sold they were bought the daughters were buried alive and and like this one when a person used to die then the deceased inheritance the heirs used to take they used to consider the wife of the deceased also as a part of the inheritance property and they used to forcibly they used to forcibly uh, get ownership of the wife also so this is a uh, a norm of uh, the arabs before the dawn of islam which has been negated and which has been condemned allah subhanahu wa taala actually wants to convey that woman herself is an individual she is a person she has soul she has feelings she has desire she cannot be bought she cannot be sold she cannot be inherited so allah subhanahu wa taala says that it is not lawful for you to inherit women by compulsion and do not make difficulties for them in order to take back part of what you gave them unless they commit a clear immorality and do what read it from the verse wa ashiruhunna bil ma'ruf and live with them in kindness here in this part of the verse 9 of surah an-nisa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the muslim husbands Allah is teaching them guiding them coaching them to be a perfect husband Allah is ordering all muslim husbands regarding their behavior their mannerism their attitude toward their wives and there are so many sayings and ahadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which would help us understand the message of ashiruhunna bil ma'ruf that allah is asking the husbands to live with their wives in a very kind manner prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hadith like hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in tirmizi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said among muslims they are more perfect in faith who are perfect in morals and the best of you are those who are best to their wives similarly hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and her reports in tirmizi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said among muslims his faith is more perfect whose behavior towards everyone is good but the best is you who is loving and kind to his wife and about himself prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hadith has at aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha reports in tirmizi that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said good among you are those who are good to their wives and look i on my part am very good to my wives so there you are if the muslim men they want to perfect their faith then as a husband they have to be kind they have to be polite to their wives sayyidna jabir bin abdullah radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports in muslim that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his farewell sermon was heard saying oh people 
Fear Allah concerning your wives. You have taken them on the security of Allah as your wives and they have become lawful to you on his word and his commands. It is your right that you do not wish that someone comes and sits on your beds. If they commit that mistake, you may punish them in warning but not severely. And it is your responsibility to arrange for their food and clothing and necessities in a reasonable manner. So, fulfilling all the needs of the wife is the duty of the husband. Fending, fetching, providing, clothing, feeding, these are all the duties of the Muslim husband and these are the rights of a Muslim wife. Hazrat Haqim bin Mu'awiyah and who reports in Ibn Majah that Prophet sallallahu says, Feed her what you eat and clothe her with what you wear and do not give her a blow on your face and do not call her names and do not separate her to place any place other than your own house. So this is like teaching men all forms of kindness and love and all forms of politeness to the wife. And spending for the wife is basically the duty. All forms of economic commitments providing for the wife's necessities of life is basically the duty of the husband and it is the right of a Muslim wife. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala and who narrates in Muslim that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that anything that a husband spends on a wife is a virtue. And similarly, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala and who again reports in Muslim that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if a husband, that if a person spends a dinar in the way of Allah, a dinar in getting a slave released, a dinar as a charity to the poor, a dinar on your family. The last dinar is the best regarding reward in hereafter. So where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it obligatory and making it a duty for the husband to arrange for the economic requirements of the wife and it is make Allah is making all this as a right a due religious right of the wife at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also promising a lot of reward for the husband who spends for the wife similarly Allah says, uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith which is reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who in Muslim that a Muslim no believer no Muslim husband should foster any grudge against his believer wife and if she has a habit which is unacceptable to him she might have other acceptable habits so Quran and Hadith are telling the husband to be forbearing patient and tolerant towards the wife Similarly, we see that there are so many other ahadiths in which the Prophet ﷺ has instructed the husbands to be nice and polite to the wife and to be not to be too strict and harsh. Hazrat Abu Huraira who reports in Bukhari and Muslim that the Messenger of Allah said, O people, follow my advice concerning your wives. I charge you to treat your wives with kindness and love. Women have been created from the rib and the rib is curved by nature and the greatest curve is in the upper part of the rib. Before I proceed with uh, the rest of the words, I think I need to stop here and uh, I would want all, all my addressed audience, my uh, my sisters, my daughters to realize and to accept the crookedness of a woman's nature. We have to accept that we have a crooked nature and we we cannot, we should not say that we're going to get away by saying that this is how it is and I can't do much about it. No, this is not going to be like that. We realize, we accept that we have a crookedness in our nature and what we're going to do that we are try we're going to try to correct it and to eradicate it 
and to take it out of our temperament and out of our attitude so that the bond of love between our husband and as a husband and wife can glow and it can flourish and it can it can increase so the prophet sallallahu said that woman has been created from the rib and the rib is curved by nature and the greatest curve is in the upper part of it if you try to straighten the curved rib by force it will break and if you leave it alone and make no effort to correct it it will remain curved forever so follow my advice this is the advice to to the muslim husbands so follow my advice and treat your wives kindly and well prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is thus advising the husbands to avoid being harsh hard strict to the wives and uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that do not try to straighten them or you will break them break their hearts break their emotions or you might even break your relationship and you might even end up in breaking your house and your marital bond then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that uh, has in a hadith reported by hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu in muslim no believing man hates his believing wife if there's a bad quality in her there should be a good quality in her as well so these were the words of uh, the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam trying to explain it to the muslim husbands how they are supposed to relate with their wives and then if we look at the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how it explains ashiru hunna bil maruf we will see that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was most caring and loving and gentle and kind to his wives once the companions asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that who do you love the most prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said aisha just imagine just just imagine does does any husband of today announce his love to his wife so vocally and so clearly declaring announcing and accepting that his wife is his beloved and then the companion said the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we we intended asking you from among the men folk from the men companions and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again said aisha's father hardly any hardly any husband of today would be saying something like that and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to call hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha by a nickname by a pet name like he used to many times he used to call her aash and hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she narrates so so many incidences in her life of uh, which would show and exhibit and demonstrate the way prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam dealt with her hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha reports in bukhari and muslim that she was a very young girl she was a young girl when she got married with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she says that she used to play with the dolls even after the marriage and some of her friends used to play with her and uh, when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to come to the house her friends they used to quit playing out of the respect of uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they used to hide in the inner portions of the house but then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to Uh, send them back to her he used to find them and they he used to send them back to her and then he used to ask them to play with hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and then they would resume playing with her just imagine how how tolerant how patient how caring how kind and how loving similarly hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha reports an incident she says that i was sitting i was playing with my toy and uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came and he asked aisha what is this hazrat aisha said that i told him that this is my horse and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked that what sort of a horse is this it has wings so hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha said that okay well, it, it, there's nothing queer about it because hazrat suleiman's horse also had wings just imagine Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with all his commitments how busy he was as the head of the state of Medina as the army chief of Medina as the chief justice of Medina 
like so many revolutions, so many, so many battles to be fought and so much of dawa, so much of tabligh to be done. And there with all those commitments and all his busy schedule of life, he had all the time in the world. And then coming down to the level of a teenager girl, conversing, interacting, giving time. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha reports in another incident in Abu Dawud. She says, then uh, there was an occasion that I was accompanying the Messenger of Allah on uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a journey and uh, we ran a race and I won because she said that I was very light and I was very young. And afterwards, when I had grown slightly heavier and bulkier and fatter, we again ran a race and we competed with each other. And this time, the Prophet Sallallahu went and then the Prophet Sallallahu remarked, now we quit. So, so you see what friendship and what frankness and what a beautiful exemplary relationship between the husband and the wife. Then the Prophet ﷺ was like showing a sport to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha reports in Bukhari and Muslim. She says that uh, the Abyssinians were having a sport of lancing in the mosque. And to show it to me, the Prophet ﷺ stood at the door of my apartment, which opened in the mosque, using his mantle as a screen for me. And I watched the game to the, sp uh, to the space between his shoulder and his air. And she says that the Messenger of Allah, uh, Messenger of Allah, وسلم, he kept on standing for my sake till I felt that I had seen enough of it and I retired. And she added, you can imagine from this that what was the place of a young and a fun loving girl. This is really surprising how much time, how much attention, how much care is being extended to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ with such a busy schedule. And then Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha narrates her incidences. There's so many, any other incidences which she narrates. And uh, then she says that there was an incident in the Prophet ﷺ's life in which my my head used to be in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's lap and uh, his head used to be in my lap and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to be, um, he used to, when his head was in my lap, he used, there were times when he was asleep and there were times when he used to be reciting the Quran and Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her was pressing his head and there were times when she used to be combing his hair and oiling his hair and then there were incidents when Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her had headache and her head was in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was stroking her hair and he was rubbing her forehead and he was saying that, oh Aisha, I love you. If you die in my life, I shall bathe you. I shall clothe you in the coffin with my own hands and I shall offer funeral prayer for you and I shall low down in your grave myself. This is the intimacy and this is the love and this is the closeness which all these incidents are very clearly highlighting and explaining to us. And then the incidents of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in uh, occasion when we see that Hazrat Aisha Raziallahu Ta'ala Anha narrates that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was at the place of a wife's house and another wife came, um, cooked something and sent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the other house. And uh, when the slave who came with the plate of food, this uh, wife in which, uh, in whose house the Prophet ﷺ was staying, she got annoyed and she threw the plate away and she threw the food away. No scolding, no getting upset and no losing of temper. Prophet ﷺ was sitting on the floor, he was picking up the food, he was picking up the utensil and he replaced the utensil and he addressed the people and he said that your mother got envied. 
This is the tolerance. This is the forbearance. This is the patience. This is the soft heartedness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the incidents are not just with Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her. There are occasions when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, relating even with the other wives as well. Hazrat Safiya radiallahu ta'ala and her came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once and she was crying. And uh, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? What do, what do the normal husbands do when they find their wife crying? Normally we hear sentences like, we heard words like, I hate to see you cry. Stop all this nonsense. Put off, get off with this, this drama and get off with this nonsense. But Prophet ﷺ was there wiping her tears, asking the reason why she was upset. He was consoling her. He was advising and suggesting her the solution to her problems. Prophet ﷺ asked her the reason and she said that the wives were uh, were, were, were comparing herself to the, with themselves and they were labeling her as the daughter of a Jew. And she was upset because of that. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi smiled while he was wiping off the tears. And he said that, oh, uh, Safiya, you should have told them. You should have just told them that Musa Alayhi Salaam was my father. Harun Alayhi Salaam was my paternal uncle. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is my husband. So how come you are one up? That how, how can you claim that you are superior to me? So you see all this love and attention and kindness we can continuously see in all these occasions and then i suppose one of the most beautiful incidents is narrated in bukhari when a wife of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling with him and uh, she was riding a camel and the women of those period when they were riding the camel they used to sit in the compartments which were kept on the camel's back and a person, the driver was uh, driving the camel so fast that the compartment on the top of the camel was like badly jolting from the right to the left. And the Prophet ﷺ said, he called on the person, Oh, Andrash, woe, you to, woe be unto you. Don't you see that there are glass crystals in the compartments? So the Prophet ﷺ said he labeled his wives like glass crystals. This is the care. This is the softness. This is the kindness. This is the mercy which we like, which we learn from the Prophet ﷺ Sunnah. And for us, Quran says in Surah Ahzab, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ and there is to sure the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is a model of excellence for you. So. From this, we derive all the basic duties of a Muslim husband and the rights of the Muslim women as we understand from Quran and Hadith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders, وَآشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And live with them in kindness. For if you dislike them, perhaps you dislike a thing and Allah makes therein much good. But if you want to replace one wife with another, but and you have given one of them a great amount of gifts, do not take it back from them. Would you take it in justice and manifest sin? And how could you take it while you have gone in unto each other and they have taken from you a solemn covenant? So now the verse number 20 and 21 is... Uh, educating the Muslim husbands not to take back the bride's gift and uh, the mahar from the wife. And there is a sahih hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave an example and he said that the example of the person who gives a, who gives a gift and then takes it back or asks it, asks for it, is just like a dog who eats the food and then vomits it and then licks up his vomit again. So it is a very disliked act to give somebody a gift or to give the wife a bride's gift and then to take it back. 
do not marry those women whom your fathers married except what has already occurred indeed it was an immorality and hateful to allah and was evil as a way prohibited to you for marriage are your mothers your daughters your sisters your fathers sisters your mothers sisters and your brothers daughters your sisters daughters your milk mothers who nursed you your sisters through nursing your wives mothers and your step daughters under your guardianship born of your wives unto whom you have gone in but if you have not gone in unto them there is no sin upon you and also prohibited are the wives of your sons who are from your loins and that you take in marriage two sisters simultaneously except for what has already occurred indeed allah is ever forgiving and merciful in the verse 22 and 23 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now explaining a few relationships of men seven relations of men with which a muslim women is not allowed and it is not permissible or it is haram for a muslim women to marry and similarly there will be seven uh, male relationships uh, seven female relationships with which a muslim man is not allowed and permitted to marry and it is haram for him to marry those seven women the seven women who are haram for a muslim man to marry are the mahram relationships these are what relationships like now let's just make up a list as is mentioned in this uh, verse mothers and mothers are uh, the real mothers or they may be the step mothers and then they may be the grandmothers maybe the maternal grandmothers or the paternal grandmothers and the great grandmothers and then there are the daughters the daughters may be the real daughters or they may be the step daughters and uh, a hadith clearly tells us that it is haram according to the laws of quran that a man if he has had a physical relationship with a woman then it is haram for a man to marry that woman or that wife's mother or that wife's daughter it is haram and then after the mother and the daughter are the sisters these sisters may be the real sisters or they may be the step sisters maybe they may be the maternal step sisters or they may be the paternal uh, step sisters and then they are the maternal or the paternal aunts and then they are the nieces may they be the daughters of the sisters or the brothers so they are the seven relations in which a muslim man cannot marry in any situation or circumstance dances and it is haram and it is forbidden to have nikah with these seven relationships of women similarly for women now for women there are there are seven male relations would be the father may it be the real father or the step father the paternal or the maternal grandfathers or the great grandfathers and then the son either it may be a real son or it may be the step son and then brothers may they be maternal step brothers or paternal step brothers or the real step a uh, real brothers and then paternal uh, paternal uh, paternal uncles and maternal uncles and then the nephews may they be the sons of uh, the sisters or the sons of their brothers a muslim woman cannot cannot marry or cannot uh, wed any of these seven male relations around her so these are the seven relations and uh, before uh, proceeding i will also want to clarify as has been explained in uh, the verse number 22 also that it is also forbidden to keep two sisters simultaneously in nikah and uh, also to keep the aunts and the nieces in uh, in their marriage simultaneously is also forbidden 
as far as the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who were married to Hazrat Usman radhiyallahu ta'ala and who in his life it was so that uh, the two daughters Hazrat Ruqayya and Hazrat Kulsum they were married to the uh, to Hazrat Usman radhiyallahu ta'ala and who and it was in a manner that first one of them uh, passed off and after the death of one sister Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, gave the hand of the second daughter to Hazrat Usman and Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explaining the merits of Hazrat Usman radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he said that if i had a third daughter to be wedded i would have wedded her to hazrat usman radhiyallahu ta'ala and who and it was not because he was wealthy it was because he used to spend very generously in the way of allah and then the next thing we need to realize very clearly is that the seven relations which i have mentioned of men or of women these are haram or forbidden for marriage as far as in three forms or three groups or three circles the first of these seven relations would be the relations of kin that is the real blood relations the relations with the due to the womb of the mother these seven relations would be haram the second circle of these seven relations would be according to the lactation according to lactation that is raza and that is the foster relationship like it is mentioned in this aya also that your milk mothers and your milk sisters so as far as lactation is concerned we need to understand that the lactation which proves a relationship to be a mahram relationship is that lactation which was done in the period of initial period of 2 years wal walidatu yurzina auladahunna hawlayn kamilayn so on the 2 years which was uh, the obligatory period of lactation the relationship of uh, lactational relationship develops only for the lactation in those 2 years and hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and her reports that if somebody uh, that if somebody has lactated from 2 to 5 times and with each feed took an ample amount of milk to fill the belly or to fill the stomach and the tummy then only these relations of uh, milk mothers or milk sisters will be proven and they will hold forbidden the third circle in which these seven relations are haram is the relation of the in-laws that is for men the wives mother or the wives sister or the wives daughter or the wives aunts and the wives nieces he cannot marry similarly for the women or for the wife the husband's father and the husband's son and his brothers and his uncles and his nephews she cannot marry it is forbidden so now first i explained the seven relations and now i have elaborated that these seven relations are according to three categories number one being the relations of kin that is the blood relations then the seven relations according to lactation relations and then the third category or the circle is the relations of in laws now another thing which you need to understand about these mahram relations is <coughs> the next point which i would want to elaborate and want to make clear is that the first category seven relations of the first category that the relations of kin the second category that the relations due to lactation they are and the two types of relations of in-laws that is the wife's mother and the daughter or the husband's father or the son these two out of the in-laws and the seven of the kin and the seven of lactation all these relationships are permanently they are permanently haram and never ever in no situation no circumstances never ever during the life a man or a woman that is a husband or a wife can marry this relationship under no set of conditions these are the relations of hormat these are the mahram relations which are permanently permanently haram and forbidden but as far as the last 
five relations of in-laws are concerned. That is the wife's sister, aunts or the niece and the husband's, husband's brother, husband's uncle and his nephew. For the wife or the husband, these will be haram as long as they are alive and as long as they are husband and wife. As soon as the either of the two passes off, either of the two either passes off, that is dies, or the relationship of marriage is broken by the divorce, then the divorced wife can marry all these five relations of the divorcing husband after the divorce. Similarly, if a wife dies, or if the husband divorces the wife, then this divorcing husband can get married to all those five relationships of the previously divorced wife. So these last five form of relations are temporarily haram. Since they are temporarily haram, so for Muslim women, the order of the, the whale holds for a Muslim woman in front of these five relations because under certain conditions and in certain circumstances, she can be wedded to them and she can get married to them. So shaitan can make some form of fitna and shaitan can misguide in certain situations. So to prevent all this and to prevent certain forms of sins in this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran makes it obligatory for a Muslim woman to observe and to cover her face with a veil in front of these temporarily mehram relationships of men which she can marry under certain situations. And I will refer to these five forms of relations when inshallah we will talk in detail about the orders and the commandments of whale in Surah Nur and Surah Ahzab. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, Allah is, for, for, uh, is ever forgiving and merciful. And also prohibited to you are all married women except those your right hands possess. This is the decree of Allah upon you and lawful to you are all others beyond this provided that you seek them in marriage with gifts from your property desiring chastity, not lawful sexual intercourse. So for whatever you enjoy of marriage from them, give them their due compensations as an obligation and there is no blame upon you for what you mutually agree to beyond the obligation indeed Allah is ever knowing and wise so now in the verse 24 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us about certain things regarding a Muslim marriage and about marriage it has been said that the Muslim a husband is supposed to provide with the marriage gift from his property to the wedded to the wedded wife or the bridegroom should give a bride gift at the time of marriage before i go ahead with the discussion of the bride's gift i think i would like to talk of all the requirements and the conditions which are mandatory to be fulfilled in a Muslim marriage. Wedding itself, marriage, getting married, making nikah is an order of Quran. It is obligatory for Muslim men and women to have nikah. It is a farad of deen. It is an obligatory command of Allah and it is a persistent sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith said, An nikahu sunnati wa man yarabu an sunnati falaysa minna. Nikah is my sunnah and whoever deviates from my sunnah is not from among us. Similarly, 
explaining the excellence of marriage. Hazrat Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports in Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and suggested, O oh, young men, those among you who can afford must get married because wedding keeps eyes cast down and guards the private past from immoral acts. One who cannot afford to spend, that is spend for marriage or for wedding, should keep fasts as fasting will curb the sexual desires. Similarly, as far as the marriage and its uh, excellence is concerned, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith reported by Hazrat Ibn Abbas who in Ibn Majah, we have not seen anything more effective for two loving souls than the ritual of wedding. So it is a very effective thing. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, a hadith reported by Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu that when a person weds, he completes half portion of his religion. Hence, he must be fearing of Allah for the rest of the half of his religion. And there's a very, there's a very nice promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports in a Hassan hadith in Nisai that the Prophet sallallahu said that Almighty Allah assures helping three persons. Number one, the slave who makes agreement with his master for his release and intends to make payment of money. Number two, one who weds to keep himself away from sins. And number three, one who participates in a war in the cause of Allah. So the person who weds to keep himself away from immorality and from committing sins, then Allah has taken guarantee that he will help him. So wedding is obligatory and it is a sunnah of the Prophet Now talking about the conditions which are uh, which have to be fulfilled and which have to be met before uh, nikah is done, are I will be talking about them now in detail. The first requirement is the permission, the willingness and the presence of the guardian of the bride who is called in Sharia as the Wali. Hazrat Abu Musa anhu, reports in a hadith in the Rimzi that the Prophet wasalam, said, La nikaha illa bi wali. That there will be no, there will be no nikah in the absence of a guardian. So according to this hadith, the marriage or the nikah, which is done without the permission, without the willingness in the absence of the wali or the guardian of the girl, like the court marriages of today, they are not legal marriages and the wedding and the marriage is not considered legal. And when the wedding or the nikah is not legalized in Islam, then obviously and very obviously the relationship after this form of or like after a court marriage will be considered as a zina or adultery. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her reports in Tarimzi that the Prophet sallallahu said that if a woman got her wedding performed without the permission of her guardian or the wali, then what was said is that this wedding is invalid. The wedding is invalid and the wedding is invalid. So this is a very important requirement which has to be fulfilled. And uh, similarly, uh, another hadith uh, reported by Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and who is that the Prophet sallallahu says without the permission of the guardian or the ruler, wedding is not solemnized. So the wedding is not acceptable in the lights of Islam and in the teachings of Islam. The second, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the uh, guardian the right, but the, asks the guardian to take the permission of the girl as well. So the second condition which has to be fulfilled is the willingness and the acceptance of the bride and the bridegroom both. And uh, as far as the concept of willingness is concerned, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates a hadith in Ibn Majah that the Prophet sallallahu says that uh, there is um, there should be allowance for the 
permission of the wife, the hadith reports that a widow should not be married without being asked about it. And the virgin girl must not be married without seeking her consent. The companions asked that what, what is the virgin girl's consent? The Prophet said that if she remains silent and does not refuse, then this is her consent. Similarly, in other hadith reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira, in Abu Dawood, the Prophet says, Virgin girl shall be asked for her marriage, and she, if she is silent in response, then this shall be considered as her consent, and if she refuses, then she must not be compelled for consent. So if any woman or girl is forced and under compulsion made to uh, to be wedded then if she wants she is entitled to get her marriage annulled from the court and this is a concept of sharia and as far as getting the willingness and acceptance of the bride and the bridegroom, Sharia definitely gives them the permission of having well, willingness. As we just uh, went through the verse of Surah, uh, Surah Nisa, Ma Lakum, that which the women or the girls who appeal them. And Prophet also asked, and uh, there, there were more than one occasions when he, he used to ask his companions to see the woman he was uh, intending to get married to. Hazrat Abir bin Abdullah who reports in Abu Dawood that Prophet said, When one of you intends to marry a woman, he should, if possible, have a glimpse of the woman. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Huraira who reports in Muslim that a person came and he asked, and he uh, was uh, taking the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu and told him that he was going to get married to an Ansari woman. Then um, the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, have you seen her? He said, no, that I have not seen that Ansari woman. So Prophet Sallallahu said, go, go and see her because Ansar women, they have some defect in their eyes. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu said that seeing the woman before the nikah is better for your mutual understanding and bond of love. So this is like the second prerequisite that the willingness and the acceptance of the bride and bridegroom be taken. And then uh, after uh, this, the third uh, thing uh, which is uh, mandatory and which is a prerequisite is the presence of the witnesses. And uh, the fourth thing is uh, the holding of walima. The walima is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, it is the advice of the hadith itself. As Atanas radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports in a hadith from Muslim and Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, uh, a companion, Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he came over and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam noticed a yellow spot on his garment and he asked, what is this? So, uh, Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Auf said that I've got married to a woman and I've given her, uh, he told a little amount of gold. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, may Allah bless you with bounty, now host Walima dinner through uh, meat of a goat only. Uh, it is like a lot of uh, food or something very heavy or very extensive form of walima or a dinner is not needed, but at least some simple form of thing should be done if uh, the person, uh, the, the groom cannot afford too much. But remember, the purpose of this walima is to share the joy and the blessings of uh, the marriage with the relatives and with the fellow beings and with the friends. And secondly, the actual purpose is to announce the marriage because there is uh, no concept of hidden or secret marriages in the Sharia. And then Prophet has also asked the Muslims that if somebody in, uh, invites you to the dinner of his wedding, then he should, it is a right of a Muslim on the Muslim that he should accept it. And uh, then after this is, uh, there is a sermon of the nikah. It was, uh, uh, it was a sermon which the Prophet has taught us to be recited at the time of nikah. And uh, last but not the least is the bride gift which is uh, in Sharia, it is in Quran, it has been called as Mahar. This is obligatory. Giving the Mahar or the bride's gift is obligatory. As uh, we went through the ayah number four of uh, Surah Tunnisa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly said, Fatuhunna Jurahunna Farida. So it is a 
faridai deen and it is obligatory for the muslim husband and it is the duty of the muslim husband and it is the right of the muslim wife similarly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, ayat number uh, sorry the previous ayat which i said is ayat number 24 and in ayat number 4 of surah an-nisa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa atu an-nisa sadaqati hinna nikhla that uh, give them out of will and happily give them their um, all the all the dower money so this is now a persistent sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh has taught us that uh, it has to be given as an obligatory duty and um, there is a hadith which uh, clearly highlights that if a person does not want to pay off his wife this dower uh, or the bri- bridal gift then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that one who fixes or agrees to a bride's gift for which he has no intentions of paying then he will he will be presented to allah on the day of judgment as an adulterer so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself paid this bride gift to all the wives and uh, as reported by hazrat abi salma bin abdul rahman in a hadith of uh, muslim uh, he said that the mothers of the faithful uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam paid them a bride's gift of 12 and a half okia and uh, which was equal to almost 500 dirham so uh, we need to realize that uh, this is not the fixed amount that has to be given we just want to uh, i would want to repeat that this amount of bride's gift or the dowry was given by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the economic conditions which was prevailing in the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to have an idea hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports and narrates in a hadith in bukhari he she was addressing her nephew and she was telling her that oh nephew in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, one moon used to come and the second moon used to come and the third moon used to come and the the fire never used to burn in the houses of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the nephew was so so upset and he was so shocked he asked that what did you eat as a daisha was allah taala and has said that we used to take water and we used to take the dates other than few situations when the neighbors used to send us the milk of the goats and that you you can feel that used to be like a, a lovely treat for the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so in this economic background prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was seen giving 500 or 12 and a half okia of silver to his wife so this bride's gift has to be according to the economic affordability of the groom himself and there's no concept of fixing it and the purpose of basically uh, giving this bride's gift is to educate and to let their husband or to get him used to the concept from the day one that all the economic commitments are his and from the day one he is being trained that fending fetching providing feeding clothing and providing for her economically is his duty and from day one he is being uh, trained to give gifts and to fulfill her requirements and uh, it can be it can be anything it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in form of cash or currency or in form of gold or in form of jewelry it can be anything like um, we uh, we can um, see that the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reported that uh, the best the best bride's money that a companion of or a sahabia took from her husband was hazrat umm sulaim radhiyallahu ta'ala anha hazrat umm sulaim radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she got widowed and after she got widowed uh, hazrat abu talha radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports that i felt like i was uh, attracted to her because she was beautiful and she was wealthy and she was very very sharp and well read so she he says that i felt like getting married to her and he sent her proposal but um, hazrat umm sulaim radhiyallahu ta'ala and has said that i can't get married to you and i can't accept your proposal because you you worship idols and i i am i am the worshiper of allah one qulu wallahu ahad la ilaha illallah so she refused the proposal and uh, there and then 
because he was really very desirous of getting wed to her. So he said that he offered that if I embrace Islam, will then then, then will you accept my proposal? And she said that, okay, yes, if you give me your conversion to Islam, you give me as my bride's gift, I'll take it, I'll make it as my bride's gift, and then I will accept your proposal. So he accepted Islam, and they were, they were uh, wed with each other. So this was like the best bride's gift, which uh, Hazrat Umay Sulaim received from her husband, and then it can be anything. It can be anything as simple like uh, there's an incident narrated in uh, Bukhari that a woman came and uh, she offered herself to get married and she proposed to the Prophet Wasallam. since uh, there was no command of Allah to the Prophet Wasallam to get married to the women, Prophet Wasallam refused and uh, there was a companion there. Uh, he he asked Muhammad Wasallam that I don't have a wife and I need to get married. So just uh, let us get married with each other. Prophet Sallallahu said that, okay, go find, he was he was extremely pure, uh, poor and Prophet Sallallahu said that, okay, go to your house and try to look for something to give her as a bride's gift. He went to his house, he came back, he said, I don't have anything at my house. And then Prophet Sallallahu said, go, go again and look, look for something. You might have a ring of iron or bronze in your house and let that be her bride's gift. He came back and he said that Prophet Sallallahu I don't even have a ring of iron in my house. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu then asked her rather than if it had been certain things like this had been in days of today, anybody would have said, oh, you poor person, when you don't even have an iron ring, why do you want to go ahead and marry a woman? You won't be able to require fulfill her requirements why do you want to get married so the prophet said that okay fine do you uh you uh, no, and you remember 10 ayahs of the 10 verses of the Quran? He said, yes. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu then asked that lady that if he teaches you these 10 ayah, would you let it be your bride's gift? And would you get want to get married to him? And she also accepted. And their bride's gift or dawah was what? These 10, the teaching and education of these 10 verses of the Quran. So it has to be given, but it can be anything. So these are the 10, uh, the uh, requirements which have to be fulfilled before the marriage has to be done and these are proven by Sharia. Now in verse number 25 Allah says and whoever among you cannot find the means to marry free believing women then he may marry from those whom your right hands possess of believing slave girls and Allah is most knowing about their faith and you believers are of one another so marry them with the permission of their people and give them their due compensations according to what is acceptable so here even you can realize that a muslim a muslim man when he is marrying a believing slave girl even then he is supposed to give any form of a bride's gift and even then he is he is supposed to take permission from the slave's master without the permission of the slave girl master also the marriage cannot be done they should be chased neither of those who commit unlawful relationships randomly nor those who take secret love affairs but once they are sheltered in marriage if they should commit adultery then for them is half the punishment of free unmarried women this is for him among you fears who fears sin but to be patient is better for you and allah is forgiving and merciful now from a part of this uh, verse number 25, uh, verse number 25 or Sufrat al-Nisa and uh, similar uh, uh, verses in the Quran also, we derive the concept or the orders of contract marriage in Islam. Contract marriage as it is called in uh, the language of Sharia as nikah e it is prohibited and it is haram. And from where do we derive it? It is ayah or the verse number 20 of Surah An-Nisa where Allah says that you will have to make even in the previous ayah and in this ayah also Allah says that you will uh, have to get married to uh, not just to have physical relationships but to be chaste. <coughs> 
now marriage in islam has to be done with the intention and with the purpose of having and establishing and a family life and the purpose of marriage in islam is not just for the sake of physical satisfaction or enjoyment contract marriage is a form of marriage which is done with a specific intention with an evil and a sinful intention when there is a man and a woman who want to have a physical relationship but they do not want to commit adultery so what do they do is they try to nauzubillah summa nauzubillah min zalik they try to make fun of the verses of quran and at the time of making nikah they dis- make a pre decided period they decide they decide that they will live as a husband and wife for such and such period and after that they will separate they will have divorce and at the time of marriage they never attended to have a family way so this marriage which was just and just done to fulfill the physical requirements and there was no intention of spending the lives together or of having a, and raising and bearing a rearing a family this is called as a contract marriage or nikah e mutta and according to a part of the verse 25 of surah an-nisa and similar words uh, verses having similar words it is haram according to these ayah and uh, then according to the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it has also been prohibited and um, it has uh, been seen that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact there are uh, words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a certain period when he permitted the companions to perform muta and uh, it was a very prolonged a uh, battle travel and uh, prophet and his companions sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions were traveling in a expedition of battle and there was a prolonged stay away from their homes and from their wives and from their families and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam permitted them to do muta but when he returned to medina he cancelled and again the contract marriage was forbidden in the sermon of uh, the, the sermon of the last hajj prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the sermon of the farewell hajj also he uh, uh, forbidden the and he said he declared it as haram and uh, so the hadith in one hadith when he permitted the later hadith uh, annuls the previous hadith because the concept of annulment is not just regarding the verses of the quran some hadith which was um, expressed and which was told later on by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at a later part of the life about certain concept or about certain thing does if it is contrary to the previous it annuls or it abrogates or abolishes the previous words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so uh, the mutta nikah is haram and uh, there is a hadith in muslim which is reported by hazrat rabia bin sabra he says that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said o oh men i had permitted you to have mutta with women but now allah allah the magnificent has forbidden it till the day of judgment hence if any one of you has with him a woman of that kind he should abandon her and whatever you might have given her you should not take it back from her so the contract marriage is unlawful and it is not halal Allah wants to make clear to you the lawful from the unlawful and guide you to the good practices of those before you and to accept your repentance and Allah is knowing and wise and Allah wants you wants to accept your repentance but those who follow their passions want to digress into a great deviation verse number 28 and allah wants to lighten for you your difficulties and mankind was created weak o oh, you who had believed do not consume one another's wealth unjustly but only in lawful business by mutual consent and do not kill yourselves or one another indeed allah is to you ever merciful 
So here uh, in this verse number 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, forbidding the consumption of somebody else's wealth in a unjust or in a haram manner and uh, what can be the unjust or the haram manner of consuming somebody else's wealth would be like uh, taking bribe or uh, taking control of somebody's right or somebody's property or somebody's estate or theft looting plundering money laundering cheating deceiving fraud or uh, devouring the property of inheritance of the widows or the orphans uh, telling lies to sell bad quality goods or black marketing and hoarding or giving less weight and measures earning from indecency or uh, any form of uh, riba or uh, not giving the haq meher or uh, the bride's uh, gift which we just talk about and also giving dowry to the daughters or the or the sisters is not also lawful so asking for or taking dowry by the husband or by the parents of the husband or uh, demanding for them is also not going to be halal and it is also going to be a batil mal Verse number 30, and whoever does that in aggression and injustice, then we will drive him into fire. And that for Allah is always easy. Lillahi Rabbil Alameen Ameen Summa Ameen Inshallah we will be starting our commentary from uh, the ayah number 32 and it is a very very important ayah of uh, the surah and where we, we will be discussing about the supremacy of the husband and about the rights of the husband and about the duties of the husband and when there is any form of disagreement between the husband and the wife how would it be settled and uh, we might also so be talking about the rights of the orphans and the poor and of uh, the uh, underdeprived uh, people of the society. Fiamanillah. Remember to share our uh, videos and remember to keep on inviting as many fellows and friends you can to make them understand the concept of uh, Quran and the teachings of Islam and help us spread the message of Islam as far as you can. Fiamanillah.